Thanks for tuning in to the Business of Digital podcast. And today we're going to be talking about first party data, zero party data, and what is up with data in general. And I'm so happy to be sitting here with Judge Schneiderman, uh, country manager of Jebit. And uh, good morning, Jed. Great to be here. Uh, yeah. So, and it's great. It's a great time to be here, isn't it? There's a lot going on. Absolutely. <laughs> so why don't we start off by talking a little bit about what what is Jebit? I know that um, you've been there for a few months now, um, kind of exciting stuff coming from your corner. Uh, what is it and, and what gets you kind of jazzed about being there right now? Sure. So why don't I just tell you a little bit about Jebit and then tell, tell you what's gotten me excited and what keeps me excited. Um, Jebit is a creative platform. So if you think of Canva or Photoshop, um, Jebit is specifically designed to create like interactive experiences that capture declared data or what is often called zero party data. So think conversations at scale. If you were to walk into a store and you could pick your favorite retailer, be it big or small, most often you'll be greeted by someone and they'll just ask you what brings you into the store. Well, what are you here to do today? Um, they'll probably look for visual cues. They might see if you're alone or if you're with someone. They might ask you if you are with someone who you're shopping for, what the occasion is. They might ask you for your budget, your preferences. They might ask you if you've shopped the category, how knowledgeable you are. We basically power those conversations on scale. And so first party data, declared data, zero party data, there's just a massive opportunity for brands to just talk to consumers online, learn more about them by simply asking them. Funny that, that's the, that's the crazy little insight. And then basically super serve them online once they learn more about their preferences, their traits, and um, other things. That's kind of cool. So when you think about consumer activity online, have they taken... You know, sometimes when I'm walking into a shoe store and somebody approaches me, like as as I cross the threshold um, and I get sort of asked questions immediately, uh, I don't even know what I'm doing in the store. Sometimes I'm just meandering sure. in because I just kind of feel like, I don't know, the vibe of the store is kind of yeah. nice. Um, so do, how do consumers expect this? And, and do you think that um, they can transfer uh, or, or, or does it translate online the same way that it does in a, uh, in a physical bricks and mortar store? So I like to think about it this way. I think there is a massive untapped opportunity. So if we go back into the Wayback Play machine, the promise of digital was one-to-one, -one, right? right? So digital was supposed to be easy. It was supposed to solve all of our uh, like problems. And it was supposed to make the world a better place. We won't get overly philosophical about sort of the impact of digital on society. But with respect to what we're talking about today, digital was really about one-to-one -one conversations. And I think what's happened over time that's been a real challenge for brands is so much of what marketers do online, so much of what uh, digital practitioners do online is based on inferred data, right? Mm -hmm. It's based yep. on the site that you go to, it's based on what you look at, um, it's even based on what you buy and then reverse engineering who you are and what segment you fall into. That's a miss, right? And so I think what we're now seeing is consumers want a benefit. And if they can realize a benefit, they will provide information. And that could be save me time, that could be help me make a decision. It could be like unlock a benefit for me that maybe I didn't know about. And so one of the challenges of digital, even if you look at some of the biggest, most successful brands on the planet, you're still forcing consumers to walk up and down the aisle and do a lot of the work to find what they like. It could be an article. It could be a piece of clothing. It could be um, an electronics item. And so the, the, the aha moment for me and what we've really unlocked at Jebit is if you can save time, if you can unlock a benefit for consumer, they're more than happy to tell you 
age, gender. They're happy to tell you um, what kind of pet they own. Is it a dog or is it a cat and what kind of breed? Because for a pet owner, they want to get the best food for their pet. And so that's really the aha moment. And essentially, we're just letting brands do that at scale. And that's the most exciting part. It's almost um, surprisingly simple. Like when you tell people, oh, we've got this platform. You don't have to know how to code. All, all you need to really know is what questions to ask your customer or your consumer. And just we see this tremendous upside. That's the... That for me is like 20 years of digital coming together at this one nexus where you're like, really? Like, that's all you have to do. And that's what's got me excited. So I think we're at this next level within digital where brands who've already done the hard work, and you can't ignore that. You need a strong brand. You need a brand that people are aware of. You need a brand that people like. <laughs> um, so you still have to do all the heavy lifting on the brand side. But sort of on the digital side or on the CRM side or on the personalization, there's now great tools like Jebit, which allow you to go anywhere where the customer is, ask them questions, and then super serve them. I think that's super exciting. And I, I like the, I mean, the thought of, um, you know, because it's it's been, I don't know how many years since I, uh, since I had enough money to go shopping in bricks and mortar. Right. And, uh, and it doesn't seem like the, the retailers have figured out how to, you know, how to serve properly. And I, it seems to me that digital is a really great tool for marketers to understand whether or not their approaches are effective. Um, so how does a marketer you know, use Jebit and other tools to figure out whether they're doing it right, right? Because a lot of them kind of think, okay, well, as long as I just enable this thing, or and if I if I get the technology sure. and and I just kind of like like throw in a you know a, like a bunch of spaghetti at the wall, a bunch of questions, and it should serve me well. How do they know if they're if it's if it's working? Is it like directly sure. tied to to revenue? Yeah, I mean, I think probably the easiest way to answer the question is I'll start specific and then I'll go um, higher up. Almost all of our best customers, it could be L'Oreal, it could be Nestle, it could be Asics, Marmot, the NHL or CCM, most start in one of two areas. They start with a product finder. So if someone is wondering, like, where do I start? How do I use Jebit or another tool like Jebit? If you sell online or if you're providing information to consumers, the easiest thing you can do is um, enhance product discovery. So again, that would be saving someone time or finding them the right product. So most just start with a product finder um, and we've got loads of examples. The other thing that most brands do with their digital presence is they try to capture leads and the most common form of a lead is a sign up, right? It's often a newsletter. If you're an auto manufacturer, it could be a car config or book a test drive. If you're a credit card company, a bank, it could be starting um, an application for a financial product. So I use the term generically lead capture. Again, newsletters or similar starting points are where a lot of people will start. My personal pet peeve is anyone who sells online what they typically do, and it mirrors exactly the question that you asked, is you go to a website within about three or four seconds, you start looking for stuff, and a pop-up comes up that says, sign up for our newsletter, get 10% off. So the reason why it's my pet peeve is, one, they've interrupted you. So imagine walking to a store, being greeted, and then someone shoves a clipboard in your face saying, can you please sign up for our newsletter? You'd be quite annoyed or miffed, to say the least. So I'd love to see almost every brand stop doing that. For brands that insist on doing that, what I'd love them to do is rather than just collecting an email address, ask three or four questions. And we've got loads and reams of data and case studies to show that if you do that, if you gamify it, if you make it fun. So here's a great example. I spoke to two pet food companies this week. Um, they have a newsletter sign up, again, offering a discount on products. So here's the missed opportunity. They should ask what kind of pet you have. Is it a dog or a cat or some other animal? If so, what's the breed? 
And then the killer insight in the pet food category is, do you know your pet's birthday? Because that's um, a number one predictor of buying premium pet food. So within about 20 seconds, they could probably ask all these really important ideas that would allow you to, if you know it's a cat owner, in the newsletter, send them information about cat food as opposed to dog food. So it's not that difficult. So to answer your question, the easiest place to get started for most would be a product finder or something to enhance your newsletter where basically you're collecting a bunch of attributes or data points. The bigger question as to like, how do you use it? It probably just ties to your big metrics, right? And most companies at the highest level, it's how do we sell more stuff and make more money? If they're using their digital footprint, it could be owned web, it could be social, it could be anything else. Most probably look at average order value, lifetime value, repeat purchase rates and the like. So, you know, most companies when they work with Jebit have other technology in place and that's one of the benefit of working with us. So it could be Salesforce or Clavio, or it could be Adobe, all these technologies that they use that we integrate with. So in a lot of cases, it's probably just looking at your brand scorecard, something that ties to your P&L. And that's oftentimes where people look at Jebit and they try to map it back to some KPI or some metric that they get graded on, they get bonused on, they get promoted on. So that's what we would encourage people to look at. And there's obvious, there's in most cases, a pretty straight line between running a Jebit experience and improving those core metrics that most brands care about. That's really cool. So, so when uh, it, when you're implementing a tool that captures zero party data, does that tool in of itself have its own dashboard, or is it is the is the data sort of filtered through to the dashboards of said tech stack that you just described? So, like a, a marketer will have their own KPIs ma mapped out, but does Jebit have a dashboard as well that? that does something that that shows captures or that type yeah, of thing? Yeah, it does. I mean, I think one of the things that we've really cracked the code on, and I think, again, back to what we talked about earlier, again, one of the unfulfilled promises of digital. I've said over and over again in some of our past discussions and some of our events that we've done together over the years, marketing's really hard. It is. It's hard. There, you know, consumers are in a lot of different places on a lot of different devices. Two is digital is hard and digital is hard, um, notwithstanding the great work that the IAB does to standardize a lot of things and educate a lot of people. But digital is really hard because it changes a lot. It's very competitive. Brands are always trying to stay on top, maintain top of mind, like maintain top, like usage or be relevant and the like. So marketing's hard, digital's hard. One of the things that we've consciously done, and I do think we have the best product team in the world, is we've literally handed the keys back to the brand. And so what I've been saying over and over again, and you've heard me say this, is brands need to own and not rent their data. So we're a software platform. We don't own any data. So everything that the um, brand creates, they have immediate access to. It's real time. So we have a dashboard. They can see what's happening on all of their campaigns, and they can also route all of the data to all other areas of their technology stack or their marketing stack. That's critical for any brand working with any software company. I think, you know, there's a lot of different companies that do add value um, in terms of taking an idea and actually getting a message in front of a consumer. But anything that reduces the real-time nature or the control of the brand to go in and quickly assess what's working or not working really is doing a disservice to a brand. And we've solved that. So yes, we do have a real-time dashboard. All of the data is real-time and a lot of the data can get past real-time to other parts of your business so that you can optimize your social media, you can optimize your email, you could even reconfigure your website based on what you see through a Jebit experience. So again, you asked earlier, like, what gets me excited? Giving marketers tools to actually be more agile, that's actually something that gets me really excited. I know it's corny, um, but I, I think the time is now for really super serving brands. 
And once you do that, consumers end up being happier. So if you think of marketing in our personal lives, I'm happy to answer a bunch of questions if it means I get newsletters about items or categories that I shop within a retailer. That actually is going to generate higher open rates. It's going to generate higher conversion rates, which means higher AOV. If you, if you send me stuff that I'm interested in, I'm going to buy more. Okay. So, I mean, I'm sold, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think anybody who's listening would probably be sold and like, you know, sign me up for this thing. Um, I wonder from an operational standpoint, who does this? So who do you work with on a, on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it the marketer themselves, like the brand managers or are creative agencies, communications agencies taking on some of the strategic sort of play on what kinds of questions to ask? Is that a creative process or is it, you know, like what, how do you get, how do you get to the right kinds of things to ask individuals as they come in? Sure. So I think there's, I can answer the question in a couple of ways. So for folks listening, if you are a brand manager, an e-com manager, a CRM manager, if you work within a digital center of excellence, we would love to talk to you. Um, we find that those positions within organizations um, get a ton of value out of Jevit. We also have wonderful agency partners so that we know that a lot of brands are stretched for a variety of reasons. Agencies provide a ton of value. Those are digital agencies. Those are agencies that specialize in CRM, agencies that specialize in e-commerce for a variety of different reasons. Um, we love our agency partners and we work a lot with them because sometimes brands do need help um, just with capacity. And then we also have wonderful partners on the technology side. So it could be Salesforce, it could be Segment, Braze, Klaviyo, Adobe. We've got really important partnerships with basically mission critical technology companies. Um, so that's the, the, the first answer to your question. In terms of like where to start and how to build these experiences, it's so easy. It's no code. You can put these experiences anywhere. So really, what, what we recommend is, and what most companies tend to do is, they look at a part of their business that's either not meeting expectations, which is, I need more newsletter signups because newsletter is a cost-effective way of talking to consumers. I've got signal loss due to the deprecation of the cookie. I've got signal loss due to ATT, or I've got some other part of my business that used to be performing that isn't today, and I need an own channel. So you know, newsletters bubble to the top. Another great example is someone will look at their website and they'll see a really high bounce rate or they'll see a problem with conversions. We solve that beautifully because again, it's, I've got a whole bunch of stuff going on on my website. The consumer gets confused and they leave. So what we typically find is, you know, we solve for all these discrete problems and most brand managers, most e-com managers, most CRM managers can look at their, core metrics and go, this one's red, I need to go solve it. And so all of a sudden, you know, we'll get a call um, or we'll get a referral. Um, mm -hmm. There's wonderful ways of experimenting, like there's no shortcut to awesome. You know, we do find that a lot of brands will get an experience live. They'll play with the creative. We've got wonderful A-B testing within the tool. So let the data kind of tell you what's going on. And so there's, there's an easy way to step in and use Jebit and then start to then eventually optimize and, and grow the relationship with the platform. Sure. If the name of the game is to is to create, you know, that value, then that has to that has a dotted line to the experience, right? And the interaction that they have with a with a you know a tool like Jebit. Um so that's kind of, that's, that's interesting because, I mean, it sounds to me like, uh, you know, if I was at an agency, I would want to have access to, to the, you know, the panel as it were, right. Just to be able to, you know, maybe do some AB testing um, and then also think through what is a good value proposition, right? If not the 10%, 
uh, you know, then, then what, what does this look like and how can you have fun with it? And also there might be some seasonality play, right? So you might want to do different things throughout the calendar year that are themed or that are, um, you know, appropriate for said category. So I, I think that there's a lot of, you know, strategy play and a lot of creativity that, that, um, that the space really offers, which is cool. I think great marketers, really strong digital practitioners understand both the scientific method and the value of iterating. And if you own all of your own data, if you've got access to a tool that allows you to see results in real time, and you can make the changes on your own, that is like really a delightful experience for a brand manager. I remember starting my career many, many years ago, pre-digital, where so much thought went into a television ad or a print ad because we knew once we published it, we couldn't change it. And then we talk earlier about sort of some of the unrealized value of digital. We're unlocking that by giving brands the ability to see data in real time. And there's numerous examples out there. You can do it in search. You can do it in social. We're, we're doing um, the brands a great service by bringing all those channels into one platform. So you can publish Jabit like by a QR code, a short code, you can post it to Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn, or display media. The ability to iterate, leverage the scientific method so as to essentially make the most of your budget. Because what do we know? We know that for the most part, the Canadian population's not growing outside of new Canadians coming into Canada. So most brands are stuck with this conundrum as we spoke about offline, of really stealing share. And stealing share is really expensive. Most marketing comes as a percent of revenue. So if you work in a category where maybe consumption is going down, the only thing left to do is be more efficient and be smarter with every dollar that you spend. And you need tools that allow you to see what's really going on and then to basically make quick and agile decisions that are informed by data. That's the only thing that's going to get you promoted. And that's the only thing that's going to really drive ROI in your business. For sure. And I think that, you know, again, we can't stress enough the the idea of generating value and what value means. You can't have that dissonance um, sort of in the ethers right now where people become, you know, a little bit jaded by the experiences that they're, that, you know, they're being asked to engage in, right? So, so, you know, if I'm going to go through a questionnaire, if I'm going to go through something, I want to know at the other end of it, there's going to be value that is real and tangible and not just, you know, like, oh, wah, wah, right? You know, here we go again. I've been, I've been kind of duped into doing this and I feel kind of violated, right? Like, so I think that we, we all, you know, and, and we've seen this time and time again in digital where, you know, you get a new condiment like email marketing or whatever it is, and then it's just completely abused to the point where, you know, a beautiful, what could have been a beautiful saying has become, you know, the bane of an advertiser, you know, and right. consumer existent. So let's go back to what we talked about off the top, just by way of like a concrete example. If you walk into a store and asks, and someone asks you a whole bunch of questions, it used to be 20 or 30 years ago, or maybe even today in some stores, the associate might go back into the storeroom, come back and say, sorry, we don't have your size. Whereas now some stores, you know, will have a PDA, they'll have a device in the clerk's hand and they'll say, before I go back, let me go see if that item's actually in stock. They can manage expectations. So when I go online and it happened numerous times this week, I look for an item, I click, 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 and then all of a sudden it tells me it's out of stock. So I did that this week, a brand that I love, I own their products, they had a Black Friday special on, and I went to go look at items and I went to about four or five different product pages and everything was out of stock in my size. Right. Now consider what a Jebit experience would look like. This is the category that I'm interested in, these are the colors, these are my sizes will only show you the products that are actually in stock. Ergo, I'm not disappointed. I probably convert. Whereas now what I've done is I've spent about, I don't know, 10 or 20 minutes on the website. Everything was sold out. They are still running a 50% off sale. But in my mind, I've completely dismissed the brand because it's a waste of my time. 
So if you think about just asking folks a bunch of questions and what we're able to do and, and like leverage real-time product feeds, that's basically how you delight customers. And if you think about it, you step back, you go, yeah, that makes total sense. And so like, that's where marketers and brand managers and e-com managers need to start connecting the dots. It's hard to sometimes do it within an org. Our platform sometimes can act as that nexus to bring people together where they go, yeah, that makes total sense. Why don't we try to create a delightful experience for a site visitor or for a shopper? Well, all men. Right. Amen to that. And, and, you know, the, the, uh, the best part of that is that, you know, you know, in an age where everybody's talking about, you know, authentic authenticity and transparency and all that sort of stuff, it's okay. If you don't have supply, it's okay. If you're my favorite brand and you're out of the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the studio dance pants that I'm usually buy, that's fine with me right? That's a, that's, you know, don't waste my time though. Don't make me go through the, the 15 different hoops to find that out after my heart, you know, cause you know, you go through these stages in a purchase where you can almost feel the product in your hands. Um, and then you kind of, you know, at the end you're, you're disappointed. And then also the idea of you capturing that data. If I know that, you know, three weeks later, or maybe three weeks after the holidays, I get an email that says, Hey, you know, that dance pant it's available now. Well, you know, you can't ask for a better customer service experience. And hopefully, you know, that's kind of my wish for 2023 and beyond is that people use it and use tools like this to create those experiences and think it through for long term. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, anyways, so I, I, our time is running out, um, but I wanted to just leave you with one more sort of question around what you think about the future of zero party data do you like are and i guess building off of maybe what we were just talking about do you see consumers doing this more and more and do you see us getting really good at it and what are your worries about it and what else are you kind of excited about in the future sure so i mean i think if i go back to what genuine value looks like for a consumer those are never going to go away so if you can save a consumer time, if you can make a product recommendation, if you can educate them, which is maybe like an upper funnel activity, if you can unlock a benefit or you can simply entertain them, which sort of builds brand affinity, those are like six really logical starting points. What I think about the future and what I think brands, I, I like to think of start, stop, continue. It's a very sort of simple framework. Um, brands need to start giving consumers control. Brands need to own all of their data. Um, and um, if they can do both of those things, they can really unlock a ton of value. So if you own your own data through Jebit, you can run better lookalike models. If you own your own data, you can run way better personalization. You can drive way better e-com metrics. Um, stop doing things that are short term. So stop just, uh, you know, paying someone to um, sign up for a newsletter where they'll probably grab the, dis grab the discount code um, and then unsubscribe right after the fact. So we've all got the pressure of short-term metrics, but you do have ways of bringing people in. As I cited with the pet food example, you can gather three or four attributes that probably delight and create a better first run experience, which will drive better retention rates on your newsletter and all these other things. And then from a, a continue, brands need to do um, continue to try to integrate all the different touch points that they have. So we've got like one uh, beauty brand that's putting Jebit experiences via QR code directly on the packaging. So that's a great example of connecting online and offline. We've got other brands that are using QR codes at events. And so the ability for a brand to start to integrate different touch points, that's something that I'd love to see consumers do. So whether it's a QR code on a TV commercial or whether or not it's, um, you know, leveraging data um, at store that you can then power through your CRM. Brands need to think holistically because consumers don't differentiate between different departments. They don't differentiate between 
different touch points, they, their lives are integrated and they want all the back end stuff that we kind of leverage day to day. They just want it to work. They don't distinguish or delineate. So continue to um, continue to run like integrated experiences. Think holistically about painting like a grand picture of the consumer. We would love brands to incorporate Jebit and leverage probably a lot of other technologies they're using. So if they start by owning their data, if they stop by all the short-term tactics that are really a lot more expensive than they realize, and if they continue to deliver integrated experiences, um, they'll probably have a good 2023. Awesome. Well, Jed, thank you so much. Thanks for, for kind of closing the loop on, on a, on a year long discussion of, of zero party <laughs> data, first party data. There's so much to think about and you really, you know, help to simplify it today. So, um, Thank you for listening and thank you for joining us. And we will be talking about this, I'm sure, several more times in the new year and look forward to it. Thank you.